Hello, my name is Janice Brooks. I'm a professor of music at the University of Southampton in the United Kingdom, and I'm acting as scholar in residence at this year's Bard Music Festival devoted to Nadia Boulanger and her world. It's a great honor to participate, and I'm especially looking forward to this program, which is devoted to Nadia Boulanger's work as a conductor and curator of both historical and contemporary musical works. The acme of auditory disjunction. It's a wonderful phrase. The American critic Edward Tatnell Canby used those words to describe what some listeners might think they were getting when they looked at the playlist for a 1949 recording called A Little Concert, made by Nadia Boulanger. He continues, though, by asking listeners to listen more closely, to open their ears to the connections between pieces that Boulanger's combinations and juxtapositions bring to light. The little concert recording, as, as the title suggests, aimed to reproduce on record some of the trademark qualities of Nadia Boulanger's live concerts from the mid-20th century. The record puts together works by 20th century composers, uh, including uh, those by Nadia's sister Lily Boulanger and her pupils Marcel de Monsdiarly and Jean Francais, with a wide range of historical repertoire from the 12th century to the end of the 19th. So you get music by Gabriel Fauré next to a Renaissance chanson. Uh, you get music by uh, the young Corsican composer Léo Préger uh, next to an anonymous 12th century work. At first glance, it's like someone took a music history textbook and chopped it up into little pieces and threw them in the air to create a concert program. But there's more to it than that, as Boulanger's audiences would find out. Canby's liner note sums up a couple of important things about Nadia Boulanger's work as a conductor. It gestures towards the unexpected nature of what she was doing and how her concert practice unsettled certain established patterns. And it also hints at some of her reasons for doing this. But before we get into the details of that, um, let's take a few minutes uh, to think about uh, Nadia Boulanger's career as a conductor and how it began at a time when very, very few women uh, were active in this part of the musical profession. Nadia Boulanger seemed to burst onto the international conducting scene in the 1930s and her, her fame grew very, very rapidly in those years. By the end of the decade, she had become the first woman to direct a number of major symphony orchestras, including the Royal Philharmonic, the Boston Symphony, the Philadelphia Orchestra, and others. As you know, even today, the classical orchestral world has some way to go before we reach complete gender equity. And as you can imagine, things were even more difficult in the 1930s. Orchestras themselves were almost entirely made up of men. The harpist Edna Phillips, who joined the Philadelphia Orchestra in 1930, was the first woman to hold a principal position in any major American symphony orchestra. And it wasn't until the 1970s, uh, helped very much by the introduction of blind auditions, that women started regularly to gain positions in major symphony orchestras around the world. Until then, women were mainly confined to positions as harpists, like Edna Phillips, and they were almost never seen on the conductor's podium. The exception to this was all-female orchestras, which were usually directed by female conductors. All-female orchestras started appearing in Europe uh, in the middle of the 19th century, and the first American example was founded in Los Angeles in 1893. These orchestras provided training grounds and showcases for exceptional women conductors, like Ethel Bleginska, who was the director of the Chicago Women's Symphony, or Frederic Petridis, uh, who directed the Orchestre Classique in New York. In France, the composer Marguerite Canal put on charity concerts with an all-female orchestra during World War I, and the violinist Jeanne Evra founded the Orchestre Féminin de Paris uh, in uh, 1930. So this is a kind of a context of predecessors for what uh, Nadia Boulanger was doing. Initiatives like these sparked debates 
about women's professional opportunities in the musical world or the lack of them. And they provided models for future ambitions. The other situation in which women conductors sometimes appeared uh, was in conducting their own compositions. It was fairly common in the late 19th and the early 20th centuries uh, for composers to conduct their own works as guest conductors. And that was true for uh, male as well as female conductors uh, who would uh, normally conduct the premieres of their own pieces. So for example, we have Armand de Polignac who uh, conducted her own opera and ballet music and performances at the end of the 19th century. And the composer Marguerite Canal, who I was just talking about, who conducted an all-female orchestra during World War I, also conducted all-male orchestras in performances of her own compositions. Marguerite Canal was the second woman to win the Prix de Rome after Lily Boulanger became the first in 1913. And uh, Canal was a, therefore a, a, quite a notable composer and was uh, seen as somewhat entitled, therefore, uh, to direct the premieres of her own music. Nadia Boulanger's first appearances on the concert platform as a conductor uh, were in this context. In 1912 and 1913, she conducted performances of her own works, uh, including uh, songs with orchestra and uh, fantasy for solo piano and orchestra in France and Germany. She also uh, on one notable occasion in uh, the provincial town of La Roche-sur-Yonne, uh, conducted a performance of a piece called Concertstück for piano and orchestra by her lover and mentor, Raoul Pugnot, with Pugnot himself as the keyboard soloist. And this was notable I, I, because it was very unusual, would have been striking, for that audience to see a 25-year-old woman directing an orchestra uh, with a soloist um, of international fame like Pugno uh, under her direction. But Boulanger gradually gave up composition in the early 1920s and she was never involved with a fem an all-female orchestra. Her path to the podium was really pretty different from that of some of these other women conductors that I've just mentioned. So what was behind her success and what were people, what were audiences hoping to hear when they came to one of her concerts? Boulanger's emergence as a conductor in the 1930s came at a time when she had added music history to the list of courses that she was teaching at the École Normale de Musique in Paris. She had become intrigued by the links that she saw between historical repertories and very early music and uh, music of the present. Typically for Boulanger, she put these perceptions into action in sound. At the famous Wednesday afternoon sessions uh, that she held at her apartment in the Rue Ballou, she brought together her students with professional soloists, uh, professional performers, to read through musical works and comment and analyze them. She had always devoted the majority of these sessions to the cantatas of J.S. Bach, which were relatively little known at the time. In the 1930s, she started to add even more and even lesser known historical works to the menu. She became particularly fascinated with the work of Claudio Monteverdi. And she also uh, was interested in music of later Baroque composers from France, like Couperin and Rameau. Not only her students, but a variety of guests would come to these sessions uh, to listen to the performances and, the, and Boulanger's analysis. And one of these was Winneretta Singer, the Princesse de Polignac, who was the heiress to the Singer sewing machine fortune. The Princesse de Polignac was one of the most important new music patrons in France, and she regularly commissioned works from composers like Stravinsky and Defaya and many others. But she also had a really strong interest in early music. And she and Boulanger bonded over this mutual interest in both contemporary repertoire and historical music. The princess invited Boulanger to give concerts in her private salon, and she also helped to arrange and bankroll engagements in other venues, like the exclusive club Interallier or the hotel, the Hôtel Georges V. 
These concerts drew lots of attention in the press, and they soon led to engagements in bigger and more prominent, more public kinds of venues. By 1936, Boulanger had formed her own professional vocal and instrumental ensemble, and in that same year, she made her first trip to London, uh, giving a series of broadcasts for the BBC and putting on an orchestral and vocal concert at Queen's Hall, the home of the proms. The next year, 1937, her recordings of Monteverdi's works with her ensemble were a huge critical sensation, and she soon started making yearly concert tours of the United States. Boulanger's own conducting fame soon started to outstrip her ensemble's success, and the invitations to guest conduct major orchestras started to roll in. But she was never the permanent or standing conductor for a major orchestra, and this wasn't something that she seemed to aim for. In fact, she was much more attached to her repertoire and programming. That's what really stood out for audiences. And this is what her fame was really based around. The idea that she could produce an exceptional concert experience that would be different from the usual fare that concert goers would normally hear. So what was so intriguing and why was it different from what people normally expected? At the time, and I would say to a certain extent even today, early music, the classical canon, and new contemporary music were separate countries on the musical map. Many concerts were confined to only one of these bodies of music. And if you had older historical music on the same program as newer music, uh, the convention was to organize this chronologically. So you would put the early music normally in the first half of the program and, and come to the later music uh, and to, the, to now uh, later on. So this constructs a kind of an arc where historical music becomes a kind of predecessor, uh, uh, even cruder or simpler or less polished than the modern works that they eventually lead to. Boulanger instead put new and old together in what she called audacious juxtapositions. And these dramatize the relationships between individual pieces of early music and new music on the same program. Though some of these connections were narrative, that is, there's a topical connection between pieces or a connection between the texts, most of the time, Boulanger's juxtapositions bring out connections in the area of musical style and form. So, for example, the modal inflections of music by Faure or by Francis Poulenc are brought out by putting them next to a 16th century chanson. Or the metrical accents of Lily Boulanger's music are highlighted by putting them next to a piece of medieval music. The point, Boulanger claimed, was, was not just to show that modern music was rooted in historical precedence. It was also to rescue early music from history by demonstrating its essential modernity. So as she put it for her BBC audiences in 1936, the point was to demonstrate that the past lights the present, but also the present, the past, and to create new links between them. So how can we account for the creativity of what Nadia Boulanger did? There's an article that came out last year in 2020 in the New York Times by Lou Stoppard called Everyone's a Curator Now. And the author points out that the use of the word curator has spread so much, it's everywhere, so that now we can see menus or wardrobes or interior decoration being referred to as curated, as a way of referring to a kind of aesthetically conscious mode of editing or collection. Many museum professionals have vociferously rejected this adoption of the word curator into mainstream jargon, though I expect the, uh, the, the, the cause is already lost at this point. Curators, the, the museum kind I mean, 
uh, point out that the word curator originally meant to look after or to care for art and artifacts. The notion of curation as a kind of creative endeavor uh, that refers to the aesthetics of collection and display is a relatively new concept. But I think it's precisely this notion of curation as cherishing or care and a creative activity that best reflects what Boulanger herself thought she was doing when she was compiling her concerts. She repeatedly came back to the notion of the museum hang to try to explain to people what she was doing. She felt that choice and order, both in the museum and the, the concert, were utterly necessary in order for individual works to be seen in their true light. As she claimed in an early column for the Parisian journal Le Monde Musical, and, and I'm going to quote here, certain paintings cannot be brought together without doing harm to each other, whether by too great a contrast or too great a similarity. Sometimes they mutually weaken each other and become monotonous. Sometimes they destroy each other a little. In contrast, she says, when paintings are brought together sympathetically, not just chronologically or by country or style, we can understand something more profound about their form and their style. So she continues, not only does their setting help us to see them, to understand them, to feel them, it also gives off an atmosphere of which each ray seems to cast a beneficial harmony over the entire group. So for her, the same was true of music. Just like in a gallery, the choice and order of musical works can be destructive or it can be enlightening. Taking care of a musical work is partly about creating the best conditions for its display. In her mind, the concert should be like an extraordinary gallery where not just the paintings themselves, but the connections between them should be inspiring. This is perhaps just another way of saying that the whole should be greater than the sum of its parts. Is this curation? Whether or not you want to use that word, Nadia Boulanger's creative juxtapositions were aimed at making the concert a particular kind of experience, where past and present could speak to each other in unpredictable but enriching ways. In putting together this concert, which aims to reproduce some of Boulanger's own juxtapositions, the festival is hoping to give you an enriching experience of the same kind.